Good evening. My name is Saul Robbins. I'm board member emeritus of the Camera Club of New York, and welcome everybody to uh, the panel for the uh, association with the exhibit Help Me that's currently on view at the Camera Club of New York until Saturday. I'd first like to say thank you for the School of Visual Arts and the BFA program for hosting this, uh, BFA program's photo department for hosting our lecture series. And especially thank you to Rusty Gibbs for all of his technical support. How many of you have been to the Camera Club of New York before? Okay, great, fantastic. So we're 127 years old this coming year. We have dark rooms, an exhibition space, a studio, and uh, lectures such as this, workshops, a conversation series that's just been started this year, an online newsletter, a blog that's been very popular lately, and we also have a year-round darkroom residency program that gives four three-month residencies to applicants, you know, chosen applicants selected by a jury. We're a thriving base for a diverse community interested in traditional and experimental directions in photography. I invite those of you who haven't been to the space to please visit us at 336 West 37th Street on the second floor. We're open 24-7, and the exhibition space is open for viewing uh, Monday through Friday from noon till 6. The current exhibition, Help Me, which we'll be discussing tonight, found photographs from the collection of Gillian McCain and curated by Gillian McCain and Megan Kump is, as I said, open and on view until Saturday this coming. Coming up in January 14th through February 26th is Linda Salerno, an exhibition of experimental photographs from the Black Mirror series, which is curated by Alan Frame and Martin Kunz. And it will be in conjunction with a, the release of Linda Salerno's book, uh, I guess probably by the same name, um, and in collaboration with the Luigi De Saro Center in Rome, Italy. On January 20th, there'll be another lecture here at School of Visual Arts with John St Jan Stoller. And in early February, though I'm not yet sure, we're not yet sure when, in our conversation series, we're going to have the filmmaker Marie Lossier in discussion with curators Lindsay Castillo and Eliana Blasser Gould. The format for tonight's uh, panel, will be, which will be moderated by Megan Kump, it, uh, there'll be a Q&A afterwards, and I ask you to please wait until a microphone is brought for you to ask your questions or make any sort of comments, because we actually are recording this, and it also helps to allow everybody to hear the questions or comments. And afterwards, we're going to have a book signing. There's a fantastic book that was published just for the exhibition also titled Help Me. And then there's another book called 50 Photos Found by Fang with text by The Hound that we also have available for sale. Okay. So, Gillian McCain is a co-author with Legs McNeil of Please Kill Me, The Uncensored Oral History of Punk and the author of two books of poetry, Tilt and Religion. She is a former program coordinator for the poetry project at St. Mark's Church, and her work has appeared in such journals as Grand Street, Moonlit, Court, Green, and Lingo. She is currently collaborating on a book with photographer Kate Simon, a collaborative book-length poem based on Valley of the Dolls, as well as two new projects with Legs McNeil. Megan Kump is an artist who is interested in making unseen worlds visible. She has been exhibited internationally, including White Columns and the Tamayo Museum in Mexico. She has been awarded fellowships from the McDowell Colony and LMCC Workspace, and Megan received her MFA from the School of Art Institute of Chicago and attended Skowhegan, and she teaches currently at the ICP. Luke Sant, just to Megan's left, his books include Low Life, Evidence, The Factory of Facts, Kill All Your Darlings, and Folk Photography, which received the 2010 Inf Infinity Award for writing from the ICP, International Center of Photography. He teaches, teaches writing and the history of photography at Bard College. Next to Luke, on his left, is Leslie Grant. Leslie Grant is interested in the storytelling possibilities of images. Her current project with Dutch photographer Judith van Eiken. Eiken, excuse me, and employees of the International Criminal Court in The Hague focuses on the theme of international collaboration. She teaches photography at Parsons, the new school of design. And W.M. Hunt, last but not least, 
is a champion of photography, collector, dealer, teacher, writer, etc. A book, The Unseen Eye, based on his collection of, quote, magical, heart-stopping images of people in which their eyes cannot be seen, unquote, will be published next fall by Thames and Hudson in conjunction with, excuse me, a tour in the United States. So thank you, everybody. I'm now going to turn it over to Megan Kump and our panelists. Enjoy. Thank you, Saul, and thanks to the Camera Club for making this um, possible. I also just want to point out that Jillian McCain uh, will be available in the questions and answer section as well. Um, first off, um, I'd like to give a quick backstory uh, to the Help Me exhibition. About a year and a half ago, I was fortunate enough to be, <coughs> excuse me, to be introduced to Jillian McCain. Um, we quickly found common ground in our shyness, eccentricities, and interests. But on that very same afternoon, when the subject of found photography surfaced, Jillian leapt up in, oh, <laughs> thanks. Okay, leapt up and uh, darted into a closet and pulled out several boxes of photos and albums. I was blown away by, th by this strange array of photographs and by her passion for these abandoned images. A happy tsunami of uh, pictures followed. We would periodically hole up at her place, often fueled by hot chocolate, and inspect box by box Jillian's 2,000 plus photographs. We looked and looked, and Help Me was made and unmade in this way. Jillian has been amassing found photographs for over 12 years, and her collection spans a variety of photographic formats, including tintypes, snapshots, Polaroids, and is guided by instinct. <clears throat> Pictures are scattered throughout Jillian's house. Sometimes they appear where you least expect them. Um, but most of them are housed in little boxes divided into small groupings labeled with categories like awkward youth, bunnies, paparazzi, tintypes, infirmaries, magenta, what the fuck, and so on. Jillian is not a fussy collector. There are no strict rules at play, and I found myself drawn to the plaintive murmurs buried within the collection's unconscious. I was struck immediately by the melancholy and dark humor in many of the pictures, but mostly by their peculiarity. One notable thread in the accumulation reflects Jillian's affection for misfits, which she believes may stem from having to wear an eye patch as a child and a headgear as a teenager. And that penchant, coupled with my own interest in orphans and the ghostly world of photography, guided our selection process for the show, Help Me. Ultimately, we were not trying to create a cohesive, well-defined group, but rather an uncanny assortment of anonymous pictures that spoke to one another and to us. Few more. So that gives you a taste of the show, and here are a few installation shots. We chose to do it salon style, and the images kind of talk to one another, hung in clusters, and there's different relationships between them. Uh, 
Okay, and with that, um, I'd like to invite each of the panelists to speak about their relationship to found photography and present um, a project. And there'll be time for uh, questions at the end. Thank you, Megan. I can wait till my thing comes up here. <clears throat> this is the um, provisional title of further evidence. You know where you are, right? You've been here before. It may not have looked exactly like this. Memory is deceptive. But nevertheless, you can find your way around. Garage, tenement, yard, Debris that might be from construction or just as easily demolition, but very likely neither. Although ostensibly generic, these scenes could somehow only have existed in New York City. And the pictures could only have been taken in the aftermath of some sort of crime. Now and then it seems obvious what happened. But much more often the scene is mute and the only hint we have of what might have occurred is the rank banality of the image. Sometimes the image teases the eye, suggesting clues that may well dissolve upon further examination. Most often the scene is as near to a blank canvas as is possible without fading entirely into nothingness. But we insist upon brushing a dramatic gloss upon pictures that give us no actual cause for suspicion that what we see is not just as perfectly banal as it seems. The drama comes from what's missing. It's a bit like Sherlock Holmes' dog who failed to bark. What is missing is an apparent reason for the picture to have been taken. The pictures, for the most part, do not contain human beings. They do not depict scenes that are beautiful or interesting in them themselves. They do not give enough of the right kind of information to have been of any use to real estate agents. Their focus is too specific to have been of benefit in tax surveys. The inhabitants of these dwellings would have been unlikely to have taken the pictures for their own amusement. And they do not look sufficiently professional, pro professional to have been taken by the press, even assuming the press might have reason to have taken an interest in this hallway. That leaves only one possibility, which is that they were taken by the police for the purpose of securing evidence at the scene of a crime. In 1992, I published a book called Evidence, occasioned by my coming upon in the municipal archives, a collection of evidence photographs taken mostly by members of the NYPD's Fingerprint and Identification Division between 1914 and 1918. The pictures shocked me, haunted me, showed up in my dreams. I had to know everything about them, and while I was often frustrated in my investigations, I found enough hints to be able to piece together some of the stories at least the pictures certainly changed my relationship with photography. They made me look harder and try to look with a historian's eye and a detective's eye and an eye for certain off-register kinds of beauty all at the same time. Those pictures from the teens had a certain very specific look about them, even though they were made by at least four and as many as seven different people. It was a question of a equipment most likely, lens and lighting above all. In any case, that look was indelible. I looked at evidence photographs from Paris taken right around the same time, and while the generic similarities were obvious, the look was not at all the same, and neither were evidence pictures taken a few years later in other cities. Every city seemed to have its own distinct what? Style was not the word. For one thing, it was unconscious. Could we call it a fingerprint, a profile, an MO? 
The available language appears loaded, but for good reason. The connection is not idle. Detectives are in the business of detecting patterns of display or behavior that the parties themselves are oblivious to. Criminal investigation is, in effect, an intense critique of style, which subjects people, places, and things to a relentless examination. Every homicide detective is rigorous as the most exacting scholar or curator or impresario or fashion buyer or grand panel judge, lavishing such attention most often upon people, places, and things that would not otherwise be the object of such scrutiny. As a consequence, criminal investigation is uniquely suited to supply a broad range of answers when we want to know how people lived. Since most crime scenes are rigorously ordinary, since crime can occur anywhere, since people do not have the opportunity to clean up for company. So it is that the archived remnants of criminal investigations of the past are superior if usually neglected anthropological documents. But because these were also pictures, photographs, we can confer aesthetic values upon them that were never intended by anyone connected with their making, but are no less real for all of that, simply because we are looking at them with eyes that have trained on all sorts of tracks and fields. Like homicide detectives, we learn to recognize patterns, often by intuition and without necessarily even being able to name the connecting thread of a given pattern. In the course of preparing my earlier book, I happened upon a manual of criminal investigation written for detective buffs, which included a couple of tiny reproductions of photographs that despite their size, I knew at once had been made by the NYPD in the earlier half of the 20th century. A year and a half ago, I was on eBay, scrolling through the photographic images pre-1950, when I had a very similar experience. There on the left-hand margin was a thumbnail of a picture that I was immediately certain had been taken by policemen in New York City. And I was correct. It was, a lot, it was from a lot of seven assorted photos, some interesting and some not, that had been taken some time after the subjects of my book, but earlier than 1950, probably in an outer borough of, of the city to judge by the building stock. Eventually, I bought about 100 pictures from the same source, an old woman whose father had been a police detective in Brooklyn. I didn't succeed in getting much information from her. She was alternately vague, kittenish, and obdurate. She didn't know, and she didn't want to know. The backs of the photographs told me a few things. There were exactly two dates in the entire lot, 1931 and 1937. In addition, a legible license plate was a World's Fair special, 1940. There was one noted address on Bond Street in the Gowanus District, and four specified precincts, the 68th, which still covers Bay Ridge, Diker Heights, and Fort Hamilton, the now defunct 82nd, which included Gowanus and parts of South Brooklyn and Brooklyn Heights, the 83rd in Bushwick, and the 92nd, also decommissioned, which overlapped between Bushwick and Williamsburg. There are a handful of case numbers indicated, but the likelihood of my finding records of them is exceedingly slim. The stories are gone. But then the debris is also gone, and the furniture is gone, and the buildings may be gone, and maybe even some of the addresses. The people are long gone. What's left are shards of unknowable stories. Here and there, we can imagine arson or burglary, perhaps assault. There are no bloodstains or weapons. There aren't even a whole lot of personal effects visible in these pictures. The people of the 1930s were far less likely to decorate their walls than their predecessors of two decades earlier. And you couldn't call the photos cinematic, a popular adjective for crime scene photos. They might as well be going out of their way to be anti-cinematic. 
showing you the backsides and armpits of um, everything and tilting up to the ceiling and down to the floor like drunks or people with stiff necks. These are photographs of agitation. They are about all the places you look when you're desperate. You're looking for where to climb into the house, where to hide the evidence, where to start the accelerant, where to find the party you want to shake down, where to look for items dropped by the suspects in their flight, where the perpetrators found a point of access, where you left that piece of paper you were carrying around that had the directions on it, where you last saw your wallet, where you were standing when you suddenly felt dizzy, the last sight you remember before everything went black. Thank you. I want to say thank you to uh, Jillian McCain and Megan Kump for inviting me to speak on this panel. Um, I, you can't hear? All right. I wanted to thank Jillian McCain and Megan Kump for asking me to speak on this panel. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so my interest in found photographs, um, it runs along the same lines as Luke's in that I really um, am so curious about the mystery uh, that is um, within them, and that you can add your own story. Uh, there's, of course, the facts of what you see within the frame, um, but when we find photographs meaningful, um, we lend them a past and a future, uh, usually an appropriate one, uh, with clues that we see within the images. Um, but this is something that I'm really um, passionate about, this ambiguity. Um, this first image I'm showing you is one of the only things, uh, possibly the only thing I've ever stolen. Um, and I wanted to start with it because I stole it for my now husband when we were uh, much younger. <laughs> and it sort of exemplifies this idea, um, this photograph has nothing to do with me, yet it can have something to do with me. I can, I can um, imbue it with meaning. Um, and I also um, can get clues from it. So it's not just totally... Uh, meaningless, but I see this um, joy of riding a bike and these young girls and this nostalgia, um, which we can think of as a desire for something that never was, in a way. Um, so I've collected found photographs for a long time, and I'm just going to show you a few of them and then talk about a project that I've done that involves um, vernacular imagery. Uh, so these are just some that I really find, um, I guess, powerful and um, interesting. And this is a pair, I think you can tell. <laughs> Found on the street in Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you see the Blatt's cans. And this is also a pair. Um, there's something about this, um, the blurriness that makes it, on the one hand, um, a kind of ecstasy, and on the other, a kind of danger. Um, and the same with this one. Um, to me, it looks like a hazing ritual, but that's just what I think it is. You know, I, I actually have no idea. Maybe they're building something. Um, it looks like he might have some concrete. But what it really looks like to me is that he's slapping it on this guy. Um, and this one, I'm really confused. I feel like this is the same person, and they've been uh, printed many times into this image, um, and also the location totally unknown. Uh, so this one says, this is me and the men with Byron and the mine, and it's from Alberta, Canada. Um, one of the first, I'm going to talk about a project I did with salt miners in upstate New York, so this uh, image really resonated with me. And I always um, like how the information on the back of images, it gives you a bit of a specificity, but at the same time rips open the meaning. 
So you really, you know, what is that? I don't even understand um, what the story is, but I can really make one up, and I like that. Um, and the same with this one. So while I really do like the ambiguity of images, I also like the way that you can start to create a context um, for vernacular photographs and have them um, suddenly start to talk about um, a sort of personal identity and uh, cultural identity too. Uh, I've made a few series of images. This is the shaking of hands. And there's something about this really formal gesture that I, um, that I like, especially within a series. If you just saw one of these images, it wouldn't have the same impact. Another series uh, is dancing photographs. And again, there's a lot of, you, I mean, you can tell right away what they're doing, they're dancing. Um, but at the same time, it's that idea of ecstasy going towards danger that I talked about with the other photographs with the guns. Um, it almost looks like she's getting hit uh, or you sort of, you could imagine that that's the story too. So it's not just about joy. Um, there could be a darker story. And this one has a lot going on in it. Dancing, this guy, I'm not quite sure what he's doing. And then the pointing, which is the final series um, of film photographs that I want to show. Um, and this is, uh, I think, my favorite um, series, and I continue to collect these images. Um, uh, these are gentlemen who work for the city of New York and they're pointing out cracks in the pavement. But a lot of times you don't really understand what they're pointing out. What is the significance? Um, well, this is, I think, for an insurance company to see uh, the wounds. Um, <laughs> and this image I really um, think is a very powerful one. Um, not only the look of this uh, high school student staring into the camera and, in, and out at you as the audience, um, but also this idea of pointing to a globe to point where you are. So as I said, I'm interested in the ambiguity, but also the way in which you can point. Um, you can draw out certain images. You can create a context in which um, their storytelling possibilities can unfold. Oh, and then there's two more. This is my new series, um, but it's really hard to find these images um, of uh, flower arrangements. I think this is a cherry bower, but I'm not totally sure. There's no information on the back And this kind of image. So I'm really interested in tributes and um, funerary flower arrangements. Um, so the project that I'd like to discuss is called Pictures Map Shadows. I worked on it with uh, an architect, Alex Terzic, but I'll only talk about the photography aspect of it tonight. Um, so it was also in collaboration with employees of the American Rock Salt Mine in Hampton Corners, New York. Um, the idea of the project was to um, create uh, many different stories about one site. Um, and what I wanted to do was make lots of different types of images and include them together in a small publication. So I'm showing you um, images that I took inside the mine. Um, I also did research and gathered historical imagery. Um, these were from uh, publications that the mine had put out over the years. It was an <laughs> operational mine, uh, still is, um, since the 1890s. So there was a lot of information about it. Um, this image comes from a, uh, it's a newsletter put out by the mining company. Um, and it's a picture of miners' wives at a picnic. And this image really sparked an idea in my mind. How do the people that work in this mine and this mine environment um, link up to the community? Um, how do we make, how do they connect? Um, and perhaps not even in a literal sense. So what I started to do was uh, look at antique stores and junk shops around in Livingston County and choose images only that I knew were from that county. So I had an idea that these people potentially 
related to the mine, like maybe her father worked in the mine or something like that. But I didn't know for sure. And I liked that idea of the connection, um, the possibility of a narrative that's not clear, but is somewhat directed. And these are just the front and back scanned. I also photographed um, the miners themselves, um, and I did two different series with them, which was to photograph them holding their helmets as a way to show uh, sort of the personalization of a uniform. And I really liked how they, their personality came out and how both they decorated the helmets and how they stood. Oops, excuse me. Another series that I did with the, the employees of the mine was ask them to come up with ideas for photographs that they wanted me to make. So they directed me as the photographer. So this, um, I hate to say, was not my idea, um, but it was Pat Cannon's idea, and so I made the image of him. Um, and I was really interested in this collaboration with people. And here's another of the same gentleman. I also included a series of um, photographs of these kind of interesting objects that I found in the mine that potentially talked about the experience of being down there. So you can see all these different types of imagery put together would create these uh, sort of layered stories about the experience of working in the mine. Um, this is, uh, when you're in the mine, you can really taste the salt in the air and it becomes sort of after a while, at first it's a novelty, and after a while it gets really tiring, so people do a lot of um, dip. Um, and then, uh, the main reason I'm talking about this project in this panel is that I asked people to donate their own photographs, um, so vernacular images that were in their, snap, uh, their sort of snapshot albums. Um, and I had quite a few people that did donate images, and they were all of the mine. This is graffiti um, underground uh, for when they used to use carbide on the lamps, which is like a carbon, so you can draw in it and it stays. <laughs> so there was a lot of poignancy in the images that people donated um, and I think that they're the kind of pictures that I could never have taken. Um, and I think they added a lot to an understanding of this experience. On the one hand, if you have no idea of the context, um, you really just wouldn't know what this image is about. But if you see it within the framework of these other types of images, it becomes another story, another way to understand. Um, um, this. Um, uh, Jim Chest, he always carried this picture in a plastic bag in his pocket, uh, which I thought was pretty amazing. So he said, all right, you want a photograph? Here you go. And he just pulled it out and gave it to me. <laughs> um, and I scanned it. I scanned them and gave them all back, of course. But it's also, there's something really touching about um, his misspelling of Vietnam. And this image really sums up a lot of the um, sort of emotions and uh, I guess potential narratives that I get from these donated images. The sort of vulnerability of this miner. Um, so what I ended up doing was creating this small publication that I um, made many copies of and gave back to the community. So the miners that participated and also people within the community and, uh, upstate New York that gave me tours or um, information, stories, that kind of thing. Um, so you can see that there's no text and the images, they just, that's all the information that you get and they're um, put on the same level there, it's a non-hierarchical um, setup. Um, 
this is the scale of the book, so you can see it's small, you can put it in your back pocket. Um, it's soft cover, it was very modest. Uh, this is the opening that we had for the book, which was at the bar um, of a former mine, miner. Uh, and we created an installation of text from our research uh, that's sort of related to more to the architectural aspect of the project. Um, and we had a barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is the final image I want to show. It's um, the Greenway, which was right behind the bar. Um, it's a old railroad grade, now a walking path, and it links all these counties in upstate New York. So you could just walk um, for a long time. And I really like the idea of how this connects. It's like the mine and the stories there connect out into the surrounding counties. And that's it. Photography is like gay sex. It's all about legitimacy. For years and years, the ar argument was, uh, is photography art, rather like uh, gay rights? And then you have this whole conversation about vernacular photography like same-sex marriage. Anyway, I used that joke before in Boston about five years ago, and it played like mad. <laughs> uh, a person here, Dale Kaplan, and I did this symposium for two days on snapshots, and they pretty much sucked the life out of that art form. But the idea of legitimacy, this is a picture by my college girlfriend, Maureen Anderman, and I was someone who had some visibility, as, has visibility as a collector, of magical heart-stopping images of people in which you don't see their eyes. So she gives me this picture, and it sits in the drawer for years and years and years, because she was an amateur. And I didn't think you could put that kind of collection, you know, in this highfalutin collection that I had going on. And I got over it one day. For a long time, I told people it was by Gary Winogrand. People went like, <laughs> yeah, that's OK. Uh, I love this picture. This is pretty, I think this is a pretty good picture. And I think part of the conversation about snapshots is how they inform the dialogue about photography, um, composition, cultural history, all that stuff. So what I did was I went through a lot of my collection and brought a lot to show you. I was, at one point I was just gonna show the single image and then bore you to death. But then I went, no, I'll put all the pictures in. Lest we forget, one of the core elements of vernacular found photography is delight. These pictures are great. They're huge, huge fun, and people have them all squirreled away in their little shoeboxes, and don't forget about the delight. So what is this picture? I very much love the weird enigma of what's going on, this sort of weird keyhole of light over this face. So it's a complete accident, I imagine. Could be a spirit photograph, don't know. But really a treasure for me. Part of the value of a lot of these collection, of these photographs for me is that by all rights, they should have been thrown away because all the identities are lost and the reason for the the original uh, reason for the photograph is perhaps lost to us now. So the notion of found photographs, I think that's really funny because I think the photographs find me that if you're really just electrified as a collector, they just show up. People go like, I don't know you, but I've got this photograph for you. And chances are they're right. And I know at fairs, like I used to go to antique fairs, and I'd stand in front of a booth and I'd go, I know what's in here, I know what's in here, I can hear it. It was like a Geiger counter, click, 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 click. And you'd wait long enough and there, there it would be. I'm not much of a picker in terms of going through bins of photographs. I like when people, I believe in the finder's fee. Bring me the damn pictures. Also, you'll know enough at the end of this that if you find a photograph that you think is appropriate for my collection, buy it. I have a $100 rule. Just buy the damn thing. Tell me it costs what you paid, and I'll pay it back. 
don't come to me and say, like, ow, ow, ow. There was this great photograph. You would have loved it. But I didn't buy it. Buy it. Call me up. Uh, the collection has a name. It's called Collection Dancing Bear. And I just think this is one of the great. Uh, I brought some press prints, and I brought some 19th century stuff also. So this is a press print. That's me up the ladder. My day. See, I always think people are going up ladders, though, not down. So I'm ultimately an optimist. Uh, one of the values of looking at lots of anonymous, unauthored work is that you really can, you can figure out your taste. When you look at enough of them and go, I like this, I like this, I don't like that, I like this, well, this is good. Uh, I tell people I have a really dumb eye. I like pictures in the dead center of the frame. Don't confuse me. I have double vision in both eyes. And so anything with nuance, I'm not interested. Just put it in the middle. Don't fuck with me. Uh, 19th century stuff. This is, for me, one of my favorite, favorite photographs in the world in terms of storytelling. What are these ladies doing? Please don't tell me. If you, ask, if you actually know, don't tell me. Go to your graves with it. Uh, this is by the Alinari family in Italy. Uh, this actually cost a fortune. But I think it's one of, I just think it's a brilliant, brilliant existential moment. Tell me you haven't had that day. <laughs> the bag over your head. Anyway, uh, this is a Desdari uh, car uncut carte de visite sheet. Your basic baby death mask. <laughs> There's a cabinet card. Another cabinet card. Oh, there's a Robert Kappa line, I think, about if, you, uh, if your pictures aren't good enough, look, get closer. My line is, look faster. <laughs> that's his neck. Did you, you, did, you do see that. That's his, the skin around his neck pulled up. <laughs> I haven't had that day. So these are carte de visite or a cabinet card. No pupils. Sweet. This is like, for me, this is, I see things like this and I go like, oh, I love this picture. And this has perfect geometric shape and form and all that stuff. This is tintype. Tin uh, the collar of this coat is pulled up. That's basically what's going on. I don't like masked pictures so much because you can usually see people's eyes, if you think about it. I like the enigma of not, why can't I see what's going on with this person's expression or whatever. I used to be an actor, and I don't think it has anything to do with that. <laughs> but I offer that. Uh, my gifts are good. My sister, I was in my sister's house once, and I saw this on a table. This is a completely ruined tintype where the silver's all fallen off. And I saw this thing, and I went, man, this better be for me. And it was. So. Um, and then some press prints, uh, some of which I know, the, I know who the maker was, because you can read it off the back. You read the little thing. This is a guy named Peter Secure, and I love the idea that this woman who has nothing going on in her face, zero, zilch, <laughs> cipher, is going for a reading. It says, what does your face show? Facial analysis. <laughs> nothing, ma'am. Here's your money back. <laughs> this is my Eric Solomon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, it says lubrication. My favorite detail of this is the roadkill on the desks in front of the ladies. <laughs> people used to, I had people say to me that having a theme, a theme collection seems to be such a narrow way of looking at things. And I would insist that no, it's completely liberating and energizing. And I can look at pictures really fast. Uh, I would offer that the center point of the collection is really good pictures that happen to have people's eyes uh, somehow not involved. Uh, there you go. <laughs> he's not only adding, he's remembering it. Uh, I thought I'd never have a still life in the collection. This is a science stock <laughs> photograph that says contains human eyes. The Beshers go marketing. This is a picture of my parents. Not really, but it always makes me think of my parents. I think it's really funny. You, 
come up with these sort of personal anecdotal reference points. That I'll show you a picture in a bit that I swear is a family photograph, except I don't know. It's become this, these have all become family photographs. Um, this is not a family photograph. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't had that day, but I've wished it on some people. Uh, this is a Ouija. I mean, I got, what, when is it not a found photograph? It's a press print, kind of made for popular usage. And uh, the Philip Johns Griffiths, uh, Viet Cong prisoner. Oh, Cartier Bresson, okay, 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 okay. Andre Breton self portrait. But it's a photo booth picture. My God, these surrealists really, you know, you give them a dollar, they'd go crazy. <laughs> That's a new joke. I'll keep that one. Uh, this is Zorita, Madame Zorita. It's one person. Half man, half woman. So there you go. I didn't know what, what side of the collection to put it on. Uh, and I will say that a sh there's been a shift in the collection that I, the, basically the No Eyes collection is kind of over. <clears throat> Whatever neurosis fed that is, I'm all better now, thank you. <clears throat> but uh, a few years ago, I realized that I loved pictures of groups, and so I'd been collecting these crazy, crazy photographs of groups. Uh, if you look real closely at this, you can see, oh, I even have a laser pointer. Oh, no, don't do that. Oh, man. I got the laser pointer to work. <laughs> what do I do? Oh. No? No? Okay, so look over there. See that guy? See that guy? So these dudes, they say to their wives, I think it's all men, I'll be late tonight, honey. We're going down to the inn. We're having our picture made, you know, the Rotary Club. And these chuckleheads forget their mat, their hoods. So they put dinner napkins over their face, which flies in the whole face of photograph as representation and identity, and it's just crazy. Anyway, uh, so grandma, there's grandma. Once upon a time, I was asked to do a, a show of the collection in Katona, actually, upstate, and they were gonna do the snapshots, and I was really busy and didn't have time to do the installation. So they said, how do you want us to install it? And I said, shoe boxes. And I went, no, 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 really. And I went, really, 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 shoe boxes. This whole idea of putting them in eight-ply mats and putting them all jewel-like, we'll get back to that. But this is where they live, grandma, in the attic. That's where these pictures came from, and now they have new lives. But I put together a little run of snapshots, and here they go. And it has a little arc to it, which pleases me. This is the existential part. I hope you're all thinking now, you're gonna go home and go like, where's that picture of Timmy? It's funny as a collector too, because I didn't really know I had all of these pictures. And it is even stranger when I'll show you a second collection that I really didn't know I had. But the snapshots, uh, the big collection's been in Europe a couple times. And the first time I didn't do anything with the snapshots because I didn't know what to do. It was in, the, in Arles. It was just great, great, the most fun I've ever had. And then I went to Lausanne, the Musée de la Lusée, and they have this big auditorium pretty auditorium in the basement. They said, oh, do you want to do something? And I had somebody scanning all these. So we did a projection that lasted 20 minutes. And I, you know, it was like two seconds a picture. And people would take their lunch down there and they'd just sit there through all these damn photos. I thought it was really, really funny. The one thing I didn't like about the, that, pro that project was that they, they gave me specs where the pictures were huge. They were just barn-sized and I thought it, violated a kind of preciousness. I don't actually mean pre yes, I do. I love that there's this immediacy to snapshots, that little is good, and I wrestled with the idea of how do you present snapshots. The most satis so I was unhappy with Lausanne, I was unhappy with Katona, because Katona did put them in eight ply mats and didn't put them in shoe boxes. The show was in Amsterdam, and I took a dozen of these and took 
had them reproduced. I had hundreds and hundreds of prints, reproductions made and cut out with like serrated edge scissors. Those interns are still talking about me. And we put them out like Felix Gonzalez Torres so that there was this great mound of snapshots so that you walked in and you went like, ooh, whatever the Dutch, whatever the Dutch is for qu'est-ce que c'est. And I loved that it offered people this moment you had to slow down and confront it and make a decision. Do I keep it? Do I hold it? Do I touch it? Is it OK? How many should I take? I like all that. Uh, very hard to show found photographs in a form that, this is the picture I was telling you about before. This is the Frisch Brandt picture. Sorry. Um, they are all me. They all just feel like me. I'm trying to get to the end here. There is the there's a definitive picture coming up. Do you want to see the bunny again? Uh. <laughs> that's it. That's the, that's the best one. <laughs> the definitive man with the chicken on his head facing away from the camera. <laughs> so one of the things that's come up in this idea of showing, how do you show these pictures? That was a gift, that was a good gift. Um, oh, I know, here's, I went to see the Curtez show in Paris just now at Jour de Pomme and I'm like walking through picture by picture and most of those pictures are, or many of those pictures are very familiar and I get to this one little contact print and I go, I own this picture, this is amazing. I'm going home and putting the Curtez signage on the back of my snapshot. There's a picture in that show that looks exactly like this which is not to say that people, I have a dozen pictures of people doing handstands, but the cortege was, for all intents and purposes, the equal of this, and I don't know, it was weirdly meaningful to me. So the, the idea of how to show these things was something that I would talk about, and I'm trying to solve it. The collection that people don't really know about, I've been collecting American groups before 1950, and I didn't really know I was doing it. They were all kind of under the bed uh, or rolled up for the most part. But I did a little show in Houston that was terribly satisfying. Uh, it was a way of using some of the snapshots and then the, the bigger panoramics. This is the picture that I think looks like my cousins, and I, can't, and I can't remember if that's me in it or not. But in Houston, we did this. Uh, the idea being that it looks like a, a an American Legion. It's like someone took psychedelics and woke up in an American Legion hall that had exploded. And people, I love that you, you couldn't possibly look at all the pictures. That was, that was the idea. I just wanted you to come in and make your own little journey out of it and be overwhelmed by it and find it far too intense. And I found that just totally satisfying. And I'm having fun with showing that in this nice little collection. Uh, so, what's an eye? What's an eye? Who knows what an eye is? It's just being able to add faster than other people. That's what it is. In photography, it's just being able to see things before other people. So, it's like comedy. This is my new one. It's like comedy. Uh, how much, ask me what, how much two and two is. Four. You just get there before the other guy. Synthesize it quickly, really quickly. Here's my shopping advice. This is what you do when you're... If, if you're looking at a picture and the hair on the back of your hand is standing straight up, it's a very good sign. If your heart is beating louder than the voice that says don't buy it, that's another good sign. And the other thing is a thing about your feet. When you're in a museum, look at your feet. Your feet will walk you up to the pictures you like. This is valuable information for a dealer because you see someone in a gallery and you see them keep walking up to the same picture. And you walk up and you go like, hmm. You like that one, do you? Anyway, so there's a, 
I love this picture. Color TV radiation turns girl into monster. Uh, I have a book next fall. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thames and Hudson called The Unseen Eye. And uh, is that all? Uh, there we go. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, thank you guys so much. Um, do we have time for a little question? Yeah, okay. Um, what was the first found photo that you consciously had to possess or resonated with you? Was it love at first sight? Is there a singular image that ignited a spark? I shared the first one. It was given to me. That was the, literally the first one. Um, for me, it was actually a picture that probably belongs in your collection because it was, um, it was I bought it from a street peddler on Astor Place and it was discarded King Services photograph, news press thing, showing how they were going to bring uh, the Candy Kid killer into prison through an underground passage and you have a cop with his head down so you only see the crown of his hat impersonating the killer and there's a very fat man who looks like Sidney Greenstreet on one side and a very skinny man who looks like Kafka on the other. <laughs> well, I also showed the one that um, started it for me and um, just to say it was from a store in South Congress in Austin, Texas. Cool. We call them found photos, but maybe lost is a more accurate term as they're separated from the makers and from the subjects. And so perhaps they carry a sort of sense of lostness with them. Um, regarding these photos, uh, what is the connection between found and lost for you? I, I like the notion of, of context changing, that there are a lot of photographs that I'm attracted to that I really do think should not have survived because you can't identify anyone in the photograph. And if it's a family photograph, why would you keep it? And that it has survived to then show up in my life. The, the tintype with the silver, the silver all fell off, that's a mess. It's just gorgeous. So standards are different, but I think the context can change for the home, the person that's gonna take the picture, and then it has a new life. Yeah, that, I agree with that, this idea that you um, give it a new life and not to dwell on the lost aspect there. That, that, that it's sort of a exciting and it can be really um, about progression and um, progress, and that's exciting to me. Do they permeate your life? Um, and how have they influenced your work? You all work in different disciplines. And we've touched on it a bit, but. Do you know the story of the Collier brothers? <laughs> that would kind of be my <laughs> office. Actually, last year I was, I got very frightened that something was going to fall on my head because stuff was up too high and I kept rooting around and it's, it's kind of, I know where everything is, basically. A couple of pictures have gone missing, which is upsetting. The way that it's influenced my life, though, is that it, it changed my life. It gave me a life. I mean, I, I'm in the photography world and I... 30, 30 years ago, I wasn't. And that's, that's a big deal. So it gave me a life. Do you have any grand pianos stashed <laughs> away? Too many what? <laughs> grand pianos like the Collier Brothers. I don't understand. The, the Collier Brothers had Oh, pianos I don't know. That, yeah. Or dead people any either. Any other ephemeral? God, I don't think Motor so. vehicles. Dead uh, yeah. <laughs> That's just a lot of stuff. And, it's, and actually, the joke at our house is the way you can have a very minimal apartment is to have another one where all the stuff is. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the case. We have a second apartment where all the stuff is. Uh, I made myself get disciplined and put everything in archival sleeves and put the sleeves in the binders and put the binders on a shelf and the shelf occupied. I mean, it's one shelf. so. It's still like the madness is, and as far as it influencing my, my life, well, I, um, yeah, I, um, like you, I, I didn't have any connections to the photo world for the longest time. I 
sort of thought about being a photographer back when I was a teenager, but I thought I was never going to be original at it. Um, but then suddenly, you know, bingo, within the last 20 years, I write a lot about foot photography and I teach history of photography, um, which is something I never saw coming. Well, I guess I already said that my collection is very minimal, but um, gifts, give them away, send them in envelopes to people. Um, sewed them onto my uh, wedding invitations. <laughs> so that's where most of them went. And um, it's definitely impacted the kind of uh, photographic work that I do. Once upon a time, I, I was showing teenagers through the collection. And this kid asked me, why did I have to own them? And I have to tell you, it just stopped me in my tracks. And the answer was, because then they're mine. <laughs> <laughs> Not forever, but it's a completely covetous thing. And I, I'm not above, in terms of finding photographs, I'm not above going to somebody's house and insisting. The picture of the hand, the kid in the water. If you're specific with someone and say, I want this picture, sometimes they give it to you. <laughs> um. For me, there's something in searching for or in looking at vernacular or found photographs, um, which embraces serendipity and chance and happenstance, um, kind of like a walk in the woods. Um, and these are some of my favorite things. And um, does that, is the idea of getting lost or an openness to the unknown part of your collecting process? Or how do luck and happenstance um, affect, your affect the collation? Absolutely. Just show up. Show up and shit happens. That's how it goes. You start showing up the right places. And it's a, if the analogy is that it's a hallway. Life is a hallway. And there are all these doors that open into it. Look in, see what's going on. And that's, and then people, people give you those pictures. That's how you, you have to, I think, be in a very receptive, mode and then stuff comes your way and that's how you make choices yeah there's something about that it's it's well i mean it really applies to all research uh, in a way not just you know looking for photographs that if you properly magnetize yourself before going <laughs> hitting the road things will come to you i, I don't know why this is but it, it, it Ask anybody. If you're serious about this stuff, it actually works. Absolutely. It's just, you got the thing going. Mm -hmm. I, I know there's times when you go like, I don't have the thing going, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there an image that you've pursued that uh, makes you uncomfortable, something that makes you itch, but um, you felt like you needed that uneasiness? Or do you think that's an important part of photography in general? For myself, when I turned 50, I'd seen a couple of pictures. As a collector, I was always someone who was very immediate, and it was always very vis a very visceral thing. That it was the transition to being a dealer was very awkward for me because I couldn't understand this notion that, oh, I have to talk to my wife about this. <laughs> What's she going to say? No. If you like it, buy it. If you've got the money, buy it. That, that's how I worked. I walked in and I saw it, and if I had the money, I liked it and I bought it. But when I turned 50, I had seen this Joel Peter Whitkin show, and Joel has a, a decapitated man picture, this portrait of a man sitting on a stool with no head. And every, every electron in my body went off, just exploded because it was an impossible picture. It, it just screamed. It violated every word, every rule, every code, and I had to have it. And it cost a lot of money, and I found the act of buying it empowering, and I find the act of owning it empowering. It changed me in a way that I was kind of, kind of aware of. I said, if I do this, it means that I really mean business. So that's a kind of answer. 
That's a really great answer. Ah. <laughs> um, I think the image of the two um, high school students pointing at the globe would be the one that makes me really uncomfortable, this idea of um, sort of ownership and mapping and these kind of uh, sort of territorial, um, I don't know, one-upmanship and things like that, that it makes me really uncomfortable, but I'm also fascinated by it. So. I love that they, they seem to be pointing at different places. I mean, <laughs> well, they really places. aren't, but they're like a three quarters of an inch apart. And you go like, oh, one guy's gonna be in Detroit and the other one's gonna be in Lansing. And I thought, that's kind of yeah. my reading of it. Um, I, I've got a picture in, uh, in my book, Folk Photography, which is it's a postcard photograph of two men who've been um, tarred and feathered and that's one thing, but what the real killer, the punctum, if, if, as it were, is that right behind them are a couple of guys who are hiding their, their eyes. I just keep going back to your theme. Um, it's, you know, it's one thing to see people who have been tarred and feathered, but then when the witnesses are trying to protect their identities. It, it, and also the picture, the, fo the actual postcard itself looks like it's been chewed at one corner. It actually would be a really interesting theme to find photographs of events in which the spectators are what the, the curator has gone after to see. You look at the, the lynching book, the, yeah. the lynching project, that most often you look at the, the lynched person, but actually what's terribly dramatic is the lack of uh, the sort of entertainment value yeah. or, or just the passivity yeah. on the, the people looking at it. It's really, really, that's chilling. Yeah. Yeah. So that'd be an Let's do that collection. Well, we've already um, touched on this one a little bit, or Leslie has. Um, does, collect, does collecting these fo photos feel like looting? Um, or is it search and rescue? Um, <laughs> Because there's something in looking at private photos of others that is um, is looting invasive. a bad is looting a bad thing. Is there, I, is I'm there? not putting a judgment on it, um, but there's something really strange. It's like looking at someone's X-ray or something. You're seeing this personal stuff that you're not supposed to see, or are there lines of privacy that shouldn't be crossed, or does time erase that, erase those issues? Everything's fair game. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Um, you know, it, it pictures of the dead still give me a pause. You know, but I mean, pictures of people who are dead in the photograph. That is, um, but you know, you figure. I mean, it's talk about your river. I mean, pe families die out. Also, people just don't care. People will sell their grandmothers. You know, it's the most remarkable thing. My family, you know, being having been really poor, um, I have, you know, my, f my family photographs up to about 1950 um, would fit inside this folder. Um, and so it's always kind of remarkable to me that, you know, you have these, sometimes you see like these elaborate pictures, elaborate collections of well-to-do families and either the, everybody died out or nobody gave a shit. And that always just freaks me out a little bit. I think for me, um, in my work, I've managed to sidestep that a little bit because I know the people that are donating the photographs. So I guess I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> yeah. um, we live in forgetful times where stor storage mediums are becoming uh, increasingly obsolete. And I'm wondering, with the endless gadgets and the digi digitization of photography, what is the future mm. of found, found photographs, found photography? The future is um, <clears throat> the, the, the mountain in, in western Pennsylvania owned by Corbis, in, which contains whatever, you know, 40 million photo, or 400 million, I don't know what it is. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of scary that. I mean, it, I realize, yeah, the, I mean, they look just as good in digital reproduction, but there's something that's kind of awful about the notion of all the original photographs being buried forever like you know the the fact that when they when they bear when they bought the Bettman archive um, and and digitized they didn't digitize all of it they just digitized what they thought 
had commercial potential. The rest of it will presumably never be seen again. And I think that's the way of the world. It's, you know, um, these giant corporations sort of buy, hoovering up um, large numbers, I mean, press photographs especially, but it's, it's um, yeah, I, um, nothing wrong with digital reproduction, but um, I, I guess I'm an old, enough of a fuddy-duddy to still be sort of invested in the aura of the original print, you know. Um, I think that for me, uh, because I'm still doing projects in the way that I did the salt mine project, now most of the donated photos are digital. So um, I'm okay with that. There's still images that people have made that talk about whatever my subject is. So I, I mean, they're still valuable to me. It, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Though I do lo have that kind of nostalgic desire for the, the object. I don't know. I, I'm interested what people will, people who are 20, when they begin to collect things, what those things will be. I imagine that they'll be, that there'll be things that we don't think about now, that they'll be collecting, mm -hmm. and that it won't, that then there'll be a panel in 30 years about, oh, all those, uh, cassettes you collected. Why did you collect all those? Um, when you think about photography, it's young and old as a, as a collectible that, particularly the idea of collecting found photographs, this is something that's really only been part of the conversation for the last 10, 15 years maybe. Not that people weren't doing, but people now are out of the closet about doing it to keep the theme alive. Uh, that people just talk about their collections of, of the, they do a blurb book. And I, if you go on the blurb website and look at all the collection of snapshots, it's really great. It makes someone who's interested in images, it makes you want to look at them. The good news on the blurb website is you usually can read the whole book because it's on, you can go page by page by page, and so maybe you don't need to actually own it. But, um, the idea of, maybe the reasons for collecting will change too, because I think collecting is this neurosis that is based on a kind of lack of, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm talking about myself and everybody, a lack of nurturing, that, that that's what you're doing. You're making, a, you're making a nest for yourself. You're creating an order by collecting. And maybe everybody will be better in 10 years. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> um, what are the pleasures of collecting and what are the frustrations? They're pretty much the same thing, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's wonderful to collect and it's also, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a great thing. It gives you immediate pleasure and then um, it's also frust frustrating. I, you know, um, I, one thing that always bothers me about collecting um, is it's it's almost a, a huge actual phenomenon in 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 life that I started witnessing about 35 years ago, which was people who I thought should be would be great musicians instead turning out to have great record collections. Um, that collecting becomes a substitute for creative activity. I mean, um, and there's all this kind of postmodern justification of this that, you know, the curatorial, inst you know, this kind of baloney. Um, I mean, it's true that curating, that collecting, that making a, an aggregation of objects that have this wonderful subjective thing in common is a creative activity. Nevertheless, it goes all too well with our consumer culture to turn collecting into a replacement for any other kind of creative activity. I'll, I'll take a little issue with it. Maybe I'll take a lot of issue with it. The reason why some of these collections come to us is because collectors put them together. And that I think it may not be a self-conscious or conscious act that, oh, I'm a collector and I'm behaving like an artist by gathering these 
images, but I think in the case, particularly with found images and in kind of vernacular and in kind of folk, uh, those collections are put together, if they're good collections, with uh, a temperament, with uh, a consist, the good collections are put together with a consistency that really demonstrates an artistic energy, uh, a focused way of organizing that I think is an act, uh, an artistic act, and that th that's really something to be reckoned with, that phenomenon, that the collector as oh. artist, maybe small a. Okay, well, um, on that note, maybe we should open up uh, for questions from the audience. Hi, um, I actually work at a photo archive too, so I'm really like very excited by this. Um, but I kind of have a question. I uh, collect photos myself, and I'm an artist, and I'm really interested in collecting things off internet actually, because I think that you can really follow someone's like life as a psychological mirror because they're constantly, constantly photographing themselves in a way that they feel is completely normal and valid, but might seem strange. Like, and you can like really monitor someone's transformation, like a weight loss, or um, like people who live with dolls, like as their wives. And um, these images are really the most ephemeral, I feel, because they can just delete them. And then they're completely gone if they're embarrassed of something they've done because they never printed it and they just exist here. So um, along with like boxes of older images, like I also have just like thousands of JPEGs that I just take, and I hope these people will just disappear. And like, <laughs> but like, and I know like too, like I made a blog for the archive where I work, and I really actually like seeing how people are collecting the images from the collection, and I see who, who downloaded them, and what, how they get reblogged, and how people um, recollect them, and they feel as if they're theirs. And I was wondering like what you feel about um, how you feel about collecting that way, because I know I don't necessarily really own these things, but I feel like not a lot of people are looking at um, some of the more vernacular images the same way that I am. Uh, and I just was wondering what your feelings were on that. Do you mean you go, you go to like Flickr and you like pull things? Uh, yeah, I find uh, like um, kind of databases where um, people get together, like uh -huh. communal groups. Or, you know, people like all trying to lose weight or people all trying to, you know, show off their doll wives mm -hmm. or, you know, things like that. That's great. But I, I just don't know, that the, the thing is like how to exhibit it. Like I, you know, I made a whole room, like an installation that looked like a study. There, there was a wonderful <laughs> installation at the New York Photo Festival the year before last. Chris Boot did a thematic thing about gay men playing and he found someone who had been downloading images of guys he thought were hot. And he'd been doing it for a long period of time. And then he had it all done as wallpaper. And so they did this room that was all these thumbnails of different guys. And what was one of the things that was funny about it was you could see how his taste had changed. <laughs> that he was basically liking these really graphic kind of sweaty, hot guys. And then he, he liked guys with beards, with facial hair, who were these academic looking things later on. And I thought that was a really good story. But the whole practical manifestation of it was great. And the, then the funnier thing was how much women liked it. That when I was there, at least three women inquired as to how they could, how they could buy it. So I thought that was. Uh, I think this oh, is like the collection where I work, the Burns Archive. He has stuff in the ceiling. <laughs> he has so much stuff that it's in the ceiling. Yeah, actually, a lot of that has fallen on his head. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Um, hello. I was wondering, uh, I'm a compulsive collector, but of a completely different media that I don't wish to um, <laughs> admit to. But um, I think you actually do want to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead. 
Uh, we won't, and we won't tell anyone friends. what you said. I'm among friends. I'll, that's my mantra now. Um, I collect video games, See? and a, a lot of them I don't play. Um, and for me, it's a compulsion. But I was wondering if, for any of you, did you consider it, is collecting about ownership, or do you feel it's more about creating an amalgamation of a very specific thing so that they can sort of be housed together, and I don't, or, or is there something else completely that's driving you? For me, I have no idea. But uh, I was just wondering what might define your neurosis. I, I think it's about order, creating some weird order by being the, you know, collectors say they don't really own them, they're just really, what's the word I want? Mar you know, uh, hanging on to it for a period of time. What's, yeah, something like stewardship, something like that, yeah. But mm. I think it's about order. I like the video game idea, that's a great idea. Mm. Yeah, my alibi for a long time was that, um, I was rescuing these things, you know, especially in the, in the pre-internet era, you know, it was like you'd go to some barn somewhere in East Jesus, and if you didn't buy it, it was just going to get eaten by mice, you know, so it was like you were, you're, it was like rescuing, you know, oil-covered seabirds or something. Um, <laughs> but um, for me, I mean, I, my justification is that Eventually, if, I, if I'm allowing myself to buy this thing, eventually I have to write a book in which it figures. <laughs> that's, great. that's a great rule. <laughs> uh, I think for me it's definitely not about ownership. It's about reanimating and then letting it be something else and even continue to another person's collection. I will say now for me the fun of the collection is showing it, that it, that's taken on a whole different energy and it's a kind of problem solving that's huge, huge fun because my approach to it is what's the audience for this thing going to be and how can I really, really mess with them? How can I, that, the show that I did in Houston with the group pictures was really so satisfying because people walked into the room and they went like, oh my God, and that was, I did a, a show in Amsterdam and they had this really awkward room because it was real huge and had a staircase on one end and a window on the other and the walls were about 30 feet apart and it was like, how do you keep people in the room? Because most photography exhibition spaces are designed as hallways. Please leave, you know, thanks for coming, now get out. And so this thing in Amsterdam, I, had them, I asked them to go out and get two dozen chairs. So they went and got the chairs, that was very nice. And then they put them around the room. And I went, no, 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 no. Put them in the middle of the room so that when people come in, they can't get from one side of the room to the other without moving stuff out of the way. And the impact of it was that people actually sat down and talked and looked at the pictures. And I figured if somebody came in and spent five minutes talking to their friend and they looked at a picture for a minute, that was like a record. And that was completely... Completely satisfying for me. This idea that everybody comes in and goes like, whoa, that's a good show. Where do you want to eat? I want a kind of engagement. And that's fun. That's really, really, really. It's, it's the thing that I teach a class at SVA, and really the, what I'm trying to get these students to respond to is, if you're 20 now, how are you going to handle pictures in 10 years? How are you going to show them that's going to really be affecting and effective and engaging and provocative and special and remarkable and all those things? And for about three months, they have no idea what I'm talking about. And now there's, they're starting to get it. But it's a different kind of behavior for a collector, I think. Uh, we've already touched on the notion of the digital age and how it's affecting things, and maybe people collecting now JPEGs and things like that. But I guess my greater fear is somebody who also collects and somebody who teaches and who also sees my own family members doing this, deleting pictures off the back of their camera before they even look at it on a big screen. So they see this like inch by inch and a half preview and they go, mm. oh, bad picture. Mm. And they delete it. And I think a lot of the pictures that those of us who collect are interested in are the throwaways. And maybe they were saved because they cost money to print and things like that, but are we even gonna see those pictures entering into 
um, you know, before our eyes? Are we ever going to see those bad throwaway pictures, or are they just going to be gone? And so what happens when our collections, I don't know, just disappear, or dissolve, or turn into dust? So will we, will we have these collections 100 years hence in the digital age? I think human nature might just take care of that one because, you know, just as, I mean, after all, back in the day when you got your prints back from the drugstore, there were people who threw away those wonderful shots that we wish we had. Um, similarly, just look on Flickr. There are people who will have, you know, 300 photographs of their lunch with Joe, and they're, they just put up the whole thing indiscriminately. So, you know, they've got to be in there, too, if you have enough patience to comb through. I'll just give an antidote that um, my dad, instead of downloading pictures, just buys new memory cards. So every picture he ever takes, he has like a, oh, tons of memory cards. So I think there is this, uh, there is somewhat of an inability to edit. <laughs> but, but one of the phenomena in this also is that 20 years ago, people didn't know how to make, the number of people that know how to make good pictures now is dramatically different. So that the fact that they're going mm -hmm. through an editing is, a contemporary skill that they, they've looked at lots and lots of pictures and they know the good ones and so they're, they're being quite clever and it's, a, it's something that three generations ago might not have happened. So I think that's, that's in there too. You've all spoken about collecting photographs and the, 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 the sense of the old, the old paper, looking at it being chewed, so on and so forth. What about collecting negatives, reprinting old negatives? Do you lose something by either going into a dark room and reprinting them, uh, enlarging them, scanning them in and, and going inkjet? What, what's your take on, on collecting old negatives? Shoot me. <laughs> Shoot me is what I said. That's, if you're an artist, sure, why not? Mm -hmm. But I'm, that's not my interest. I, I definitely collect negatives. So some of the images I showed are scanned um, negatives. Well, you know, I mean, if it weren't for the possibility of, uh, of doing that, we wouldn't have um, E.J. Belloc's work, for example. You know, there are a handful of prints that are old, but I mean, there's so many great photographers that we only know because of later reprints. And, um, you know, so in terms of the history of photography, yeah, that's a great thing. Um, as far as the individual collector, it's one of those personal things. I mean, I, I first of all, haven't used a dark room since I was 17 years old, but also I really have an affection for, you know, decay, uh, for things that are starting to get messy around the edges and so on. There was a funny thing in Miami, at Miami Basel. They had an installation of slides of Bescher photographs. And I, and I couldn't get a handle on what I was actually looking at if they were, if they were slides from the Bescher studio that had been used in you know, for press purposes or whatever, if they had some sort of, they must have had some sort of provenance because they wouldn't have had them in the booth because obviously it had a big price tag on it. But I was, I looked at it and I went like, my God, this is, this is new. But then you think about glass plate negatives and glass plate negatives actually do have some life as a collectible. There's a kind of implied rarity with them also and You'll get it soon enough with negatives from different periods, particularly sheet negatives as opposed to roll film, but then roll film, will, you know, it'll, it all shows up. I would like to ask, how do you keep the uh, integrity of your images? Uh, where do you keep them? I mean, do you just take them and put them in a shoebox or do you have them in archival frames that last 100 years, or you just put them in a photo album? I mean, after you go out and you find something that you, you like uh, out, of, out of a box somewhere, and you pay a dollar or $50 for it or whatever it is, how do you go about keeping that image uh, the way it looks? Or do you not care if it gets old and looks uh, old or worse or aged? 
I personally don't care. <laughs> so mine are just in drawers and shoved here and there. I had stuff kicking around in boxes for years and years, and then, you know, and then I noticed that they were being deleteriously affected by this. So eventually, I forced myself to go out and buy a lot of archival sleeves and, you know, and store them properly in albums and so on. I've been collecting about, I've collected about 40 years because I'm very old. And around 15 years into it, I, I went to something and Sam Wagstaff was there. And Sam Wagstaff was the, was the preeminent collector then. And he was this very charismatic, handsome, handsome man. And I'm such a wiener. So I go, oh, Mr. Wagstaff, Mr. Wagstaff, what do you do with all your photographs? And he looked at me, and he goes like, they're all over the fucking place. <laughs> this was, in fact, liberating for me because I thought, I'm doing this wrong, I'm doing this wrong. It's some hybrid. You, you don't leave them on the stove. <laughs> but like that first picture that I show, the girl with the bag over her head, she lives, color TV, radiation, turn scroll in the monster. Um, you can see where the double-sided tape on the back of the picture has bled through. So has that destroyed the picture? Or has that made the picture more of its moment? It's what it is. So somewhere in the middle. I think if you get too precious about it, that's a different kind of collecting. And that's when you have somebody who works for you who does all that. Here, Jeeves, put these in sleeves. <laughs> well, I think Jillian's had to confront that on some level because she she collects sometimes whole albums of people, and the albums aren't, uh, you know, they're not safe materials, like the photos begin sticking to it. And so she's gone and found albums that are similar size and like reassembled them in the same order and kind of keep them near each other. But it's kind of the same where do you disrupt, you know, this amazing album that somebody's put together with notes and this and that, and all this ephemera in it, um, or do you extract it into a complete archival situation? But it, it, Fine line. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, I said actually. Oh, cool. Any more questions? That's it. No, thank you. So, who could, well, let me ask some questions. So who out there collects? So what are the people that don't collect? What are you doing here? <laughs> now, what's, what's the curiosity? <laughs> there you go, good answer. <laughs> they collect collectors. That's, who else? There you go. And what do you learn? What do you learn from this conversation about your own making of photographs? Well, I'm in my 70s, and I come from a family where I'm the last of the keepers of all of the photographs, particularly on one side of the family. And there are slides, there are photographs, there are negatives. They go back a long way. They go back to when Lindbergh flew and you had people interested in aviation. And it's very difficult because I want to preserve these things as they did. And I'm like the last of my generation in my family on that one side. And it's a difficult thing. And I see your photographs, um, particularly the one you have of the essay of the miners. And I feel very strongly about that, of course, particularly since we had those Chilean miners that were rescued. And I find that what they've done is very interesting. And I think if you've done your book, good for that, you know. Uh, at least that's going to be still lasting. Uh, others that have collected work that's anonymous, I find it very interesting to look at. Um, where they are identified on the back, I think that's great. I had an uncle that thought that was an important thing too, and I'm most grateful to him for that with what I have. Um, where there are anonymous things, 
uh, it's very interesting to see, but um, I do hope that you preserve them in some way. I found the, that uh, detective work from the police department very interesting. I'm glad you did that, too, because that tells us from another time, uh, without people in the pictures, what was happening in our society, uh, where we don't have the newspapers to show us what was going on. Um, and uh, Megan, I enjoyed your work, too. Uh, you know, that fact that you had that collection on the walls was very interesting at our camera club. So, thank you. Thank well, the you. Thing, the thing that's amazing now is the ability to do a self-published book for not, for not a fortune. So the potential for you to, as the, arch as the archivist of this material, to create something artistic uh, or, or that is, that's either artistic or a nicely put together history and perhaps find an audience for it. I think that's, that's new and that's very exciting. Um, Luke, you said something about um, these photographs um, implying that um, nobody cared about the pictures anymore or that anybody that belonged to them was dead now. But I walked into my grandmother's house one day and she was throwing out all of her negatives mm. from the 30s and 40s, and yeah. she had been the photographer mm. and very consistently did great portraits of her children and all of their friends. And everybody in my family would have wanted those. And, uh, you know, and we all have survived her. So it was just one individual deciding for some reason that nobody needed them anymore without asking anybody so that was the beginning of my collection hmm. she gave them to me wow. um anyway i want to thank all of you also and i'm gonna pass the mic to john who wants to remind everybody about <laughs> oh uh, remember we have some books for sale uh from jillian for megan and i want to also thank everybody do you have any closing comments or no just thank you for coming yeah.